from North Dakota. I ask for 10 minutes or as much time as I might need to discuss an important energy issue. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate uh, my esteemed colleague from Texas and his uh, comments and want to uh, share my uh, agreement with the important points that he just made so well. Uh, I rise today to present the North American Energy Infrastructure Act. It's a bipartisan piece of legislation that I think is very, very important to helping our country build the infrastructure we need to truly become energy independent or energy self-sufficient, energy secure, if you will. This is bipartisan legislation. Uh, it's legislation that's already passed the House. It was sponsored in the House by Representative Fred Upton, uh, who's the chairman of the uh, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, co-sponsored on the Democrat side by Gene Green, congressman from uh, Texas. Uh, I have bipartisan sponsors for this legislation in the Senate as well. Uh, on, the, um, on the Republican side, I have uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski, who is the ranking member on the Energy Committee. And then I have two other members of the uh, Energy Committee uh, that are Democrats co-sponsoring this legislation as well. Uh, Senator Joe Donnelly from Indiana and uh, Senator Joe Manchin uh, from West Virginia. And certainly Senator Manchin, Mr. President, is recognized as uh, one of the leaders in the uh, Senate on important energy issues. So I'm very appreciative of having uh, him join me on this legislation as well. Uh, I'm introducing it now. Uh, this is the sixth anniversary of the uh, application by TransCanada for a permit to approve the Keystone XL pipeline. They applied for approval of a pipeline project, the Keystone XL pipeline project, uh, six years ago as of Friday this week. Can you imagine that? Um, you know, Americans fought and won World War II in less time uh, than this application has been pending before the President of the United States, yet still no decision from this administration after six years. And this is vital infrastructure we need to truly uh, make this country energy secure. Working with Canada, we can truly produce more energy than we consume and make our country energy secure, but we cannot do it without the necessary infrastructure, the roads, the pipelines, the rail, uh, the infrastructure, the transmission lines, uh, the energy infrastructure we need to get energy from where it's produced, places like my state of North Dakota, which is now the second largest producer, producer of oil in this country, second only to Texas. We produce more than a million barrels a day of oil, but we got to get it to market. And it's getting loaded and overloaded on rail. We've got tremendous congestion on rail. Our farmers can't get their ag products to market anymore because we have so much congestion on the rail, and yet here we've got an application that's been held up for six years by the President of the United States without a decision. And that's after, I mean, last year he came to the Republican caucus, told us point blank that he would have a decision before the end of 2013, no decision. Here we are in 2014, sixth anniversary. Well, look, we can't, we can't continue to have that problem. We have got to find a way to build this infrastructure. And even though we're working on Keystone on a separate track, and I believe we'll have the votes next year to pass it, more than we'll have the 60 votes in the Senate we need to pass it. We're at 57 right now. We're very close. And I think by next year we'll have those 60 votes to pass Keystone, and we'll work to do that and attach it to legislation that the President uh, won't veto. So we'll continue to work on Keystone on that track, but at the same time, we've got to avoid this problem in the future with oil pipelines, with gas pipelines, and with transmission lines. We've got to be able to build that infrastructure not only in this country, but we've got to be able to cross the border with Canada. Canada is a huge producer of energy. And so working together, we have this incredible opportunity if we can build the uh, infrastructure to do it. And it's not just for fossil fuels. It's not just for oil. It's not just for gas. It's for renewables as well. Canada produces an incredible amount of hydro, uh, which, of course, is electricity. We need transmission lines to bring that renewable hydro uh, across the border. So this is about all forms of energy, and this is about working with our closest friend and ally 
uh, to truly address that energy issue. It's a job creation issue. It's a national security issue. So uh, what does this legislation do, the North American Energy Infrastructure Act? What it does is it expedites, streamlines the approval process for cross-border construction of oil pipelines, gas pipelines, and electric transmission lines. Well, how does it work? Well, first, oil pipelines. Right now, the presidential uh, national interest determination is needed for uh, approval or authority to build an oil pipeline across the Canadian border. And of course, that's the problem we see with Keystone. That's been held up now for six years. So this changes that process for future projects. This changes the process for future projects. As I say, it's already passed the House overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly. Uh, I think pretty much all of the Republican votes, I think more than 50 uh, votes uh, on the Democrat side, also very strong bipartisan support uh, in the House. And what it does is it changes that approval process for crossing the border with an oil pipeline uh, to the State Department. So the State Department will make that determination approving a cross-border transfer, and it will still be subject to the NEPA process. You'll still have to do an environmental impact statement, but the focus of that uh, EIS, environmental impact statement, or the NEPA process, will be on the border section, not on the entire length of the project throughout all the states that pipeline uh, may cross. It will focus on the border section. And the, the uh, State Department has to come up with reasonable rules to determine what that distance is that, that uh, constitutes crossing the, the border with Canada. And then the rest of the NEPA process will continue just as it does today for any other project that doesn't come across the border. Right now, states have their jurisdiction in some cases. Federal government has their jurisdiction in some uh, cases, depending on whether it's uh, private land or whether it's public land and whether it's federal land or, uh, you know, maybe it's a, a water, body of water, whatever. So the NEPA process continues as before, driven by the states or the federal government, depending on uh, what particular um, part of country, the type of land or body of water that you're crossing. And I think that's why it garnered such strong bipartisan support. We, you know, we continue that process and those protections, but we don't allow the determination on the cross-border cross process or the cross-border piece to be held up by all of the NEPA process and all of the sightings that may be covered uh, in all the respective states that that, that pipeline uh, crosses. Those processes are already in place. Don't use crossing the border as an excuse to tie up all these other processes and basically usurp the authority of uh, the states that are affected by that, uh, by that project. So I think it's a very reasonable process and it's one that I think we should be able to come together on in a bipartisan way, say it's open, it's fair. That's why we've got bipartisan support in the sponsorship. Senator Donnelly, Senator Manchin, Senator Mikowski, myself, all people that work on energy, because we've struck that, that balance. It's about creating a good business climate that will encourage that investment to create the infrastructure we need to move the energy from where it's produced to where it's consumed in the safest way possible, in the safest way possible, and the most economic way possible, right? That's what it's about with the best environmental stewardship. And isn't that what we all want? Obviously, it is. But if we don't do this, where are we? If we don't do this, where are we? Well, right now we're waiting six years, six years for a determination on the Keystone XL pipeline. And here's another example I'll give you. The Bakken North Pipeline, it's a pipeline in, that goes uh, from North Dakota to Cushing. And they have been waiting for a year and a half on an ownership name change from the Department of State. A year and a half to change the name. Really? Does that make sense to anybody? If it takes that long for something that simple, what do we do when we actually need to build this infrastructure that's so important for the energy future of our country? What about gas pipelines? Gas pipelines will be covered by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And what we say is that, look, 
They'll go through the NEPA process too, just like we described with the Department of State on an oil pipeline. They'll take that cross-border cross piece, do the same thing. Do a NEPA process so you have environmental impact statement, cover all the bases. But then 30 days after that, they have to make a decision. They can't just sit on it. And the rest of the NEPA process continues just like we described on an oil pipeline. Again, very simple, very straightforward, and it comports with the free trade agreements that we have with Canada and with Mexico. And then the third piece, electric transmission lines, uh, that process will be overseen by the Department of Energy. We simply streamline the process. Right now there's two applications or two permits required, one that's driven by the administration, one that's congressionally driven. We just combine those, make it one process. Again, cover all the bases, as I've described, with an oil pipeline or a gas pipeline, but we make it one process instead of a duplicative process. Well, when we look at what's going on in the world today, we see why this legislation is so important. Look at ISIL. Look at ISIL in the Middle East and what's happening there. We are right now confronting how we need to uh, address this very significant challenge. How we need to work with allies in the region to take out ISIL. Do we really want to continue to be dependent on oil from the Middle East? I think you could ask every single American that question, It'd be a resounding no. There's no way we want to have to get oil from the Middle East. But we still are today, aren't we? Yet we can produce more oil and gas in this country, particularly with Canada, than we can consume. Why would we continue to want to be dependent on the Middle East or Venezuela or any other place that is antagonistic or hostile to our interests? We don't. This is a national security issue. It's an energy issue. It's a job creation issue. It's an economic growth issue. And it's for darn sure a national security issue. Which is why every time you ask the public about it, more than two-thirds say, yes, build that infrastructure, build that Keystone Pipeline. Let's work with Canada to get our energy, our closest friend and our ally in the world. And look at, look what's going on in Europe. Look what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Look at the situation a country like Ukraine or the European Union is in because of Russian aggression, and particularly Russian aggression at a time when, where do they get their energy? Where does Ukraine get its energy? Where does the European Union get their energy? Well, they get a third of it or more from, yeah, Russia. Russia. The same country that's invading Ukraine, the same country that's occupying Crimea and the eastern part of the Ukraine, and when we try to get the European to join the European Union to join with us to push back, what do they say? Oh, geez, I don't know, we can't, because Russia's gonna cut off the gas. And it's fall and it's getting colder. Does that make sense to anybody? Is that the situation we want to be in? I think it's pretty compelling. Do we want to be in a situation where we have to try to get oil out of the Middle East with ISIL over there operating the way they are? I don't think so. These issues are all interrelated. And they're not short-term issues. They're not short-term issues. You can't just start building that infrastructure today and have it done tomorrow. These are billion-dollar investments. They don't cost the government a single penny, but they're billion-dollar investments that private enterprise is willing to make, put people to work, provide that energy more safely, more security, with better environmental stewardship, and address our national security challenges. That is a long-term plan. That type of energy plan is a long-term plan for this country, and it's one that we need to start now. It's one we need to start now. Six years. Six years we're waiting for a decision from the president for a decision on a multi-billion dollar pipeline project that will not only bring oil from Canada to the United States, but will move oil 100,000 barrels a day from my home state to refineries in this country that by the State Department's own admission will create more than 40,000 jobs that will create millions, hundreds of millions in tax revenue that will help us create energy security for our country, 
that will allow us to work with our closest friend and ally, Canada, rather than telling them, no, no, we're not, we're not going to work with you. Send that oil to China. Something the American people overwhelmingly want by about 70% in most of the polls that I guess is being held up for special interest groups or by special interest groups. Look, this is about how we run this country. This is about who we work for. This is about having a long-term plan to build the kind of energy future for America that I believe the American people very much want. Let's go to work and pass this bipartisan legislation. Thank you, Mr. President. With that, I uh, note an absence of a quorum.